Yeah. Good? Okay. Last time I did this, it was a whole thing. I just want to make sure that it's done. Sometimes we take things for granted. I don't mean that we're resentful or hateful, um, but sometimes we understand something to be a certain way when in reality it's different. The parable of the Good Samaritan is, is one such story where we have a misunderstanding. We take it for granted. It's not our individual faults. Uh, as a society, we have stretched the story to its simplest interpretation in parts. We make laws after it, we teach basic morality lessons by it, and we boil it down to the noble epithet, do good things even when you don't have to. But there's a lot more going on in this parable than what might fit on a desk calendar or a Facebook meme. The story is chock full of context and scandal and shock that we, contemporary Americans, miss out on completely. I'd like to write the story down in a way you may not have ever heard explained before and hopefully illuminate some context and draw some deeper lessons that Jesus intended to impart on his audience. Firstly, what is a parable? We might be tempted to find this kind of story as a metaphor or a cautionary tale um, or an imagined scenario illustrated to show us how we're supposed to behave. Uh, it's not that, so that we're clear. Um, a parable is a scathing rebuke. It's an insult. It's a mirror to a specific target to reflect sins. It is the ancient Israelite equivalent to a diss track, if you know what that is. The person being dissed here is the lawyer by Jesus. And we've seen this happen throughout the Old Testament as well. The prophet Nathan uses a parable uh, to diss King David to show him what he's doing wrong. To trick him into reflecting his own faults. The lawyer in the story was not the type who wore three piece suits or prepared litigation. Uh, he did not take the bar exam or study corporate law. Um, this was an Israelite lawyer who studied the Torah, also known as the Book of Law. That's why when Jesus asked him if he's ever read it, you can tell the situation is getting tense. You might as well ask the district attorney if he's ever heard of a little thing called the Constitution. Right? It's getting, getting a little heavy. The lawyer shakes this off, and he asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? The thing is, the lawyer isn't asking because he doesn't know. He's challenging Jesus. He's trying to make Jesus see the error of his ways. It's like when you ask your kids to clean up. Where are your shoes? They're in the middle of the floor. Are they supposed to be in the middle of the floor? <laughs> no, they're what? That's what's going on here. Um, the lawyer intended to humble Jesus. The lawyer was the professional here, and he wanted to put Jesus in his place. In Leviticus 19.18, which Jesus partially quotes from the Torah, he says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love the neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The lawyer understood neighbor to mean his tribal comrades, his fellow Israelites. They were the chosen people, after all, and the Torah is very vivid as to what God does with those who are not his chosen people. Instead of taking the bait, Jesus answers the lawyer's rhetorical question with a story and a follow-up question. To understand the gravity of the story, we need to understand the dire situation of Israelite life under Roman rule. Rome was an ever-expanding empire that conquered cities and countries, installed their own governors, built modern infrastructure, and levied taxes on the locals. It was an effective and efficient strategy for world domination and for hundreds of years it worked. But just as Rome was a powerhouse in the arenas of city planning and municipal tax codes, they were also brutal warlords and heavy-handed administrators of punishments. When a group of locals rebelled against the overwhelming taxes and whitewashing of local cultures, Rome had the rebels crucified and displayed on public roads for everyone to see. The corpses would remain for weeks, serving as a constant, pungent, horrific reminder of what happened you stepped out of line. But even the threat of extreme and unreasonable punishment was not always enough to deter rebellion. Instead, Rome had to get smart about it. The Romans realized that these highly tribal, dogmatic, and culturally rich uh, peoples followed their spiritual leaders. So, Rome put them on the payroll, lining their pockets and creating an environment where priests can accumulate mass amounts of wealth. The common agrarian Israelite, agrarian farmer, farm person, uh, here I look, you know. Um, the common <laughs> agrarian Israelite, Jesus' largest audience, was in a bind. 
On the one hand, they had a tax commitment to Rome that pushed them on the verge of poverty. After paying taxes, they rarely had enough to put on the table. On top of that, some opportunistic Israelite landowners, the elite Israelite families, charged more rent than the farmers could realistically afford. On top of that, the priests were able to demand, by law, a tithe from every Israelite. Because of these intense financial pressures, many Israelites had no choice but to take out predatory loans, fall into debt, sell their children, sell their belongings, become a slave, and be tortured and worked to death to repay that debt. It's no wonder why some of the Israelites resorted to banditry and thievery instead of torturing them to pay their debts. In fact, it was most likely a fellow Israelite who robbed a man traveling along the road, a neighbor. The first person who crossed paths with the purple man was a priest. We know the priest not only had the means, but he had the obligation to help the man per Mosaic law. But he doesn't. The next person who crosses the man is a Levite from a wealthy Israelite family. They were most probably landowners with the means and obligation to help the man, but he doesn't. I wonder what these men thought as they passed him. And I wonder if it's the same thing I think when I see a person in need and I keep driving, or I keep scrolling through my newsfeed, or I change the channel. I can't, I'm busy. I can't, but I'm sure someone else will. I can't, you don't use it for drugs and alcohol anyway. I can't, you might scam me. I can't, maybe if he didn't want to get mugged, he wouldn't have dressed like that. He was asking for a girl. These men, who exacted heavy tolls on their neighbors, who drove them to the edge of death and poverty, who have created a world where people are reduced to nothing if they are robbed once, and where robbers must steal for subsistence, must be sold into slavery, find every excuse not to help. But who does? The Samaritan. The person the story is named after. <laughs> um, who are the Samaritans? Why is that important? Why are you calling by his nationality? To put simply, because there is a lot of history religion and anthropology uh, and Samaritanism, the Samaritans were a different denomination than Jews. The core beliefs of Judaism were intact, and they were held in common between the Palestinian Jews and the Samaritan Jews, but the Samaritans believed that their different tribal ancestors were the heralds of the real and true Judaism. Mm -hmm. Why bring them up? Why, why use these people? Because the Palestinian Jewish lawyers hated them. To the lawyers, they represented a sacrilegious version of the Torah and the Israelite heritage. They were wrong at best, and traitors at worst. Bring them up at all, especially by an Israelite rabbi, which Jesus was, must have stung the ears of the lawyer. If it helps you to be invested more in the story, you can substitute the word Samaritan with liberal, or conservative, or Muslim, or transgender, or communist, or Antifa, or pro-life, or whatever other ideology where the mention of its name raises your blood pressure. Jesus continues. The Samaritan goes all out to help the robbed man, and he spares no expense. He chooses to walk the rest of the road and let the hurt man use his body. He spends an exorbitant amount of money, not only to heal the man, but he puts him up in a nice hotel, too. The Samaritan, the enemy, shows more compassion than the supposed neighbors, the priest and the Levite. And this burns the lawyer up to something fierce. Why? Because the lawyer works for the priests and the Levites. And he works against the Samaritans. By telling this story, Jesus not only illuminated this person's ignorance, but he threatened his very identity and livelihood at the same time. When Jesus asks the lawyer, who of these three men were the neighbor, the lawyer can't even call the Samaritan a Samaritan. He just says, one who showed him mercy. Jesus tells the man to go and do likewise. Before probably dropping the mic and crowd surfing away, I presume that that's what we're going to do. <laughs> the story is not a story of feel good charity. It's a spotlight on systemic poverty, a critique of dogmatic religion, and an attack on what Judaism had become for the Israelites a religion of wealth for the few at the expense of the many, an ideology that pushed the poor to believe God had cursed them and that God had blessed the rich. We identify ourselves with some of the characters in here. Most usually we identify ourselves with the Samaritan, what we're supposed to do, right? Or
Or we might identify ourselves with a hurt man, someone looking for saving. But we're, we are the one. As predominantly white, middle class benefactors of a system which has for hundreds of years impoverished, exploited, and lynched those who step out of line, we are the lawyer. We are the ones who become indignant at criticisms of our country, calling for the rebuke, removal, and public shaming of those who might not respect our flag for what it is represented for us. We are the ones who preach social Darwinism, which is the idea that if only the ultra poor had any work ethic, they could be successful, like us, much in the way success and blessings was seen for the Israelites. We ignore the hundreds of years of discrimination and disadvantage that our ancestors have levied against entire populations. <coughs> we often wear Christianity like pretty fake jewelry to prove that we're of a better stock, as long as one takes a closer look. To threaten our faith and practice is to threaten our very identities, and we react with anger and a thirst for retribution. We've too often been the people of no, we can't. Just like the priest. It's fortuitous that I was assigned a sermon to be titled Si Se Puede. Without cheating, do we know what that means? Anybody? Yes. Hey! There's no extra credit for that. So. <laughs> uh, it is. It's yes, we can. What a great, uplifting thing for us to, for us to say in church. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Uh, where the priest and Levi made excuses, we are called to make action. Si Se Puede. Where the religious and social elite turned a blind eye, we are called to look injustice and poverty in its face. Si se puede. Where the powers of oppression took everything they could, we are called to give everything we have. Si se puede. So it's doubly fortuitous today that it's in Spanish, considering the violence against people who speak that language in our country lately, within the past 24 hours. Originally, this was going to touch on uh, concentration camps, but yesterday, um, I don't know if you call it fortune or misfortune, but I read um, what that gunman in Texas had written online about why he did what he did. Because he hates Hispanic people. These are not the others. These are our neighbors. Never says the word. Uh, these are brothers and sisters. Uh, these are fellow Christians, even. Uh, but we have become comfortable with a system that turns a blind eye and says, no, we can't. No, we can't do anything about that. No, we can't see them. No, we can't. Maybe some of us will, but not us. Our neighbor is robbed, beaten, and half dead. Will we turn the other way despite our means and responsibility to otherwise? Or will we give ourselves to them in 